All right, good morning. It is my great pleasure this morning and honor to introduce Dr. Timothy Naftali. Um, he is currently the Clinical Associate Professor of Public Service at NYU. He is a historian and uh, he was also the founding director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum, where he authored the library's nationally acclaimed exhibit on Watergate and oversaw the release of 1.3 million pages of presidential documents and nearly 700 hours of the infam infamous Nixon tapes. Um, his work has appeared in all sorts of publications, the New York Times, Atlantic, CNN. Um, we are so happy to have him here today because he is one of the nation's experts on Watergate and the presidency. And indeed, that's what he's going to talk about today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Tim. Tim, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Melissa. Uh, and Shane, thank you very much for inviting me. And to all of you out there, thank you for being interested in the history of one of the most important challenges uh, to the constitutional order of the United States. Um, let me start uh, with a piece of tape. It's always fun to start with a, a transcript in this case. It's March 21st, it's 1973. John Dean is, is speaking with the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, and he says, well, first of all, there's the problem of the continued blackmail, uh, which will not only go on now, it'll go on when these people are in prison and it will compound the obstruction of justice situation. It'll cost money, it's dangerous. And this is the part I want you all to listen to carefully. Nobody, and I think people around here are not pros at this sort of thing. And this is the sort of thing mafia people do, washing money, getting clean money and things like that. We just don't know about those things because we're not used to, you know, and then Dean laughs, we're not criminals and not used to dealing in that business. In the spring of 1973, American men, and not just Americans and not just men, were absorbing the cultural significance of The Godfather, a blockbuster, which if you've been watching Paramount Plus's brilliant The Offer is about basically a family. Well. Watergate involved a different crime family, linked not by blood, but by loyalty to one man, Richard Nixon. And one family that was not nearly as efficient as Hollywood's version of a crime family, or arguably the real syndicate of that era. 50 years later, despite extraordinary investigations by the Justice Department, the media, by jury, special prosecutor in Congress, some mysteries remain about elements of the crime that took place at the Watergate, at the uh, Watergate complex. And I look forward to learning about what has been earthed in the last decade about what happened on June 17, 1972. That failed, black black, that failed black bag job lies at the heart of the revelation of Richard Nixon's many abuses of power that ultimately brought down his presidency. My contribution today, on the eve of the first hearings, public hearings of the January 6th committee, is to consider the significance of Watergate for our understanding of the American presidency. Our experience of the Trump presidency, I believe, underscored key elements of Watergate. The capacity of one individual to abuse the presidency, the importance of impeachment as a check on those abuses, the role of advisors in checking or abetting the presidential id. Those we all know. And many of us have considered them and discussed them in our classes, otherwise publicly. But that era also highlighted one takeaway of Watergate that is not conventional wisdom. Indeed, I would argue some of the commentary of the Trump era was founded on assumptions about our institutions that contradicted this particular lesson of Watergate. The story many told themselves about Watergate was too optimistic and missed, I would argue, warning signs about vulnerabilities in our democracy. Let me tell you a short story. The Nixon Library's video oral history program 
was a, born of a key problem that I faced as director. It was my task to create an accurate Watergate gallery in a hostile environment on a shoestring budget. I figured that technology could help. Taking an idea I'd, I'd read somewhere from Bill Gates that future museums would have flat screens allowing one to project ever-changing numbers of images. Uh, I convinced NARA in the months before I officially came on board in 2006 to buy a bunch of flat screens. I knew how expensive um, old-fashioned bricks and mortar museum exhibits were, and I knew we didn't have the money for that at the time. I planned to populate these flat screens um, from a server uh, with excerpts of interviews of Watergate personalities from all sides, the White House, the plumbers, the burglars, the mob, the media, the investigators, the congressional impeachers, and Nixon's congressional defenders. I tried to include the same questions in each interview when we got to Watergate to allow future documentarians and historians an array of answers, an opportunity to compare and contrast how different people in different parts of that story viewed similar issues. Having watched a few Watergate documentaries, I knew that some of the guilty had started to own up publicly on camera about what had happened. Chuck Colson, Bud Crow, Dwight Chapin, Jeb Magruder, G. Gordon Liddy, though in a number of these cases, it wasn't done apologetically, just to name a few. I knew that conservative members of the library's devoted Orange County community um, were not about to take my word for water, what happened in Watergate. They were not gonna take the word of a gay, liberal, East Coast, Canadian half Jew. The goal here was find a transmission system by which facts, not interpretation, facts about Watergate could be shared with a population that had been given a, an alternative reality. And that alternative reality was the Watergate exhibit we were replacing, the Watergate exhibit that had been put up by the private Nixon library, a Watergate exhibit that described Watergate as an, a coup, an organized coup by Democrats to reverse the 1972 election. Um, so it was my assumption and hope that um, the, uh, the the public, the, the, the sort of the Nixon, the, the Nixon fans who came to the water uh, the library to have certain assumptions about Nixon confirmed, might be persuaded to take a slightly different view of Watergate if they heard the story from Chuck Colson and Bud Krogh um, and Alexander Butterfield as opposed to uh, from historians, particularly those from the East. One of the themes that emerged from these interviews, and this is what I wanna highlight, was that the system had worked. A number of those we interviewed, uh, when we came to the question, or I came to the question about you know, the lessons of Watergate, a number of them said the system had worked. Now for my colleagues and I, who found ourselves becoming experts in Watergate because not only of these interviews, but the huge material, the materials we had at the library, the materials we were able to release while we were there, and the, obviously the tapes. Steeped as we were in the details of the Nixon administration's counteroffensive, my colleagues and I at the library wondered if that conclusion that the system had worked hadn't been too neatly drawn in the wake of Nixon's resignation. In other words, knowing what ultimately happened, did people not sort of project on the whole process a tidiness and an inevitability that when you walk through the events of Watergate actually wasn't there? Um, a decade before January 6th, my colleagues and I saw Watergate as evidence of how fragile our institutions were, not that the system was particularly robust. It, the outcome of Watergate, the pr a presidential resignation, depended on people, flawed and well-intentioned people, um, and some accident. 
the story could have easily ended differently. Nixon could have finished his second term, despite the break-in, the failed break-in of June 17, 1972. The story of Nixon's downfall, I would argue, is the story of unforced errors, especially by Richard Nixon himself, and the activities of quite a few courageous and not necessarily predictable actions by individuals and by accident, and one absolutely bizarro element, the tapes. And not just the fact of the tapes, but the fact that Richard Nixon, unlike John Kennedy, who had a button to press and decided which meetings he wanted recorded, which is why we have very, very few moments of President, Nixon, uh, President Kennedy talking to his brother RFK on tape, because those would have been extraordinarily revelatory. Unlike that, Richard Nixon had a sound activated. Sometimes you hear his voice activated. It was sound activated system. So it captured absolutely everything, but unfortunately not everywhere. So some important conversations that you may be discussing later on that might have, and that probably took place at Key Biscayne, uh, were not captured uh, in the wake of the uh, failed break-in on June 17th. Um, now, let me just preview the significance of my view of what I just laid out. I believe that Donald J. Trump's defenders in 2019 and 2020, I'm talking about the first, uh, the first impeachment, sought not to make those same mistakes again. I believe that there was learning that went on uh, from Watergate that, that allowed, that gave Trump added abilities and capabilities when fending off uh, a legitimate congressional investigation um, in, 19, in 2019 and 2020. So today, to try to explain this argument, I would like to discuss the role of individuals and that bizarro factor, the tapes, in the, I call it bizarro because it was totally unpredictable um, that, that President Nixon would actually tape his culpable actions. Um, the, the influence and effect of these factors in the outcome of Watergate. Um, I stress that I believe that the combination of human actions uh, in the period of 1972 through the president's resignation in the summer of 74 was so unpredictable that no one person or cabal could have anticipated the outcome. Nixon's most fervent defenders would later decry a systematic attack by a unified establishment on this man from mid 1972 on. To my mind, I see no system at work here at all, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's talk about some of the unforced errors um, and some of the accidents that mattered to the outcome. And basically, let me make clear, Nixon was guilty. So what I'm arguing here is that, that a criminal president isn't necessarily going to get caught. That, and we can, and I will continue and show how this was relevant, not only to Nixon, but to Trump. So what was the first mistake that, uh, that, Nixon and his, uh, that Nixon and his White House made? The famously anal Nixon White House chose G. Gordon Liddy to run an investigative unit for the campaign, despite the fact that he had botched his work for the plumbers. This story remains fascinating and was um, clarified to some extent by a document Gordon Strawn's notes of a meeting between Mitchell and Haldeman in late 1971 that had been held up by the struggles between the Nixonians and the US government over the control of documents until the Nixon Library released it in 2008. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that document. In retrospect, the Committee to Reelect, or Creeps, hiring of Liddy effectively connected two conspiracies, the Plumbers Conspiracy of 1971 against Daniel Ellsberg to whatever mayhem Liddy's crew did in 1972. 
It was the opposite of the compartmentalization of secret operations that we saw governments engaging in in the Cold War. Instead, it linked two potentially presidency ending crimes in a handful of people. Why was Liddy considered acceptable by John Mitchell and Bob Haldeman? Why did both have a generally positive view of the plumbers, despite the fact that the break-in um, at Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist in Beverly Hills was viewed by Ehrlichman and the leadership of the, uh, the White House leadership of the plumbers, that would be Bud Krogh and David Young, as a fiasco? Um, the selection of Liddy leads to the rehiring of the dopey second tier wannabe James Bond, E. Howard Hunt. Hunt is a protege of Chuck Colson and has an office at the White House complex with a White House telephone number. Liddy plus Hunt lays the ground for what would be a presidency ending fiasco. Had the Nixon White House recruited a professional team, we might never have heard of the campaign black bag jobs. Fortunately for American democracy, his chief aides, likely with his background agreement, didn't choose a professional team to engage in wiretapping during the campaign. Think of the black bag jobs in the Cold War done by traditional law enforcement and intelligence services in the United States that we only learned about because of the congressional investigations after Watergate. These were black bag jobs. These were uh, uh, silent entry jobs that the public, the media didn't know anything about in the 1960s. Now, to that point, the hiring of Liddy, Nixon had been somewhat protected from his worst instincts, I would argue. And let's go through a few examples. There was no firebombing of the Brookings. While the White House did pressure the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Nixon's ordered policy of suppressing Jews in the civil service was ignored. Nixon's order to use the IRS against his enemies was slow walked to death. Nixon's order to burgle the GOP's headquarters uh, in order to create a distraction after June 17, 1972 was ignored. And Nixon and Haldeman's uh, plan to pick up more war dissenters on trumped up charges in the summer of 1972 in order to have a grand amnesty, fortunately was not implemented. But in the hiring of Liddy uh, by and for Crete with the goal of campaign espionage, Nixon's protection system failed. It remains one of the most important and not predictable turning points in this story. Now, after the burglars were caught at the DNC headquarters, the White House undertook an effort to use the traditional law enforcement and intelligence services they had not employed for their dirty tricks to cover up their dirty tricks. We will hear more about the professionalism and patriotism of Angela Lano and the other FBI special agents on the ground who pushed to figure out why their leadership wasn't allowing them for a time to do all they needed to do to break open the conspiracy. And while the CIA played ball with the White House uh, a little in 1971 and for a few days in 1972 after the break-in when Nixon's demands, until Nixon's demands communicated by John Dean got to be too much for the CIA, which also turned the other way and would then begin to protect itself. Both the FBI and the CIA had broken domestic law on occasion for previous presidents. In this instance, these institutions largely would not. Nixon and his lieutenants had not counted on that. If you would have asked them, how was this system supposed to work? They would have said, well, these are executive branch agencies that are supposed to protect us, especially when we tell them that there is a national security issue at stake, even though there wasn't. The professionalism of the FBI and the work of the prosecutors led to interviews with Jeff Magruder, forcing Nixon to expose himself by suggesting to Ehrlichman how Magruder might shield the truth. While he didn't suborn perjury directly, he did it indirectly and would have been criminally liable, and he did it via John Ehrlichman. Well, if Nixon hadn't been taping this conversation, um, it's hard to believe that he would have ever been held responsible for it, but he was taping these conversations. 
And so this effort at suborning, actually successful effort to suborn perjury is caught on tape. But despite these mistakes by the White House, the cover-up held up well, as we know, through early 1973. And the cracking of the cover-up didn't happen in a systematic or predictable way. E. Howard Hunt's wife's death in an aircraft, plane aircraft, airplane crash, increased the pressure on the White House for additional hush, hush money. James McCord's letter to John Sirica confirmed a Sirica, a, a suspicion that Sirica and his law, chief law clerk had that there had been lying in their that there had been lying in their court, a suspicion that led him to give the burglars very long sentences. It was not predictable that uh, the um, the burglars would draw a judge who would react in this way by using long sentences to try to get more truth out of what had occurred before and on June 17th. The McCord letter puts pressure on as yet an unindicted, on as yet unindicted insiders like Dean to find a way out. The Senate Watergate hearings become a model of what congressional hearings can turn up. But it was helped, first of all, by the excellent reporting by uh, Seymour Hirsch, Woodward, and Bernstein, um, and Nelson of the Los Angeles Times, though I would say Bernstein and Woodward's reporting is the most important, but it's not the only important reporting of the fall of, in the fall of 1972. But that alone didn't necessarily lead to the Senate finding details. It did, I think, push the Senate to have these hearings. What helped the Senate was that Richard Nixon waived executive privilege and allowed his lieutenants to testify. Um, that helped. But even in political terms, even given the importance of Dean's testimony against Nixon, however vivid and damaging it was, that alone didn't lead to impeachment or the resignation. It led to a national debate over who was telling the truth. I think symbolized by at least one Time magazine cover, you know, with Nixon and Dean. And historically in those fights, presidents win. The public generally will support a president over what his defenders would describe as a disgruntled former employee. And then came the revelation of the tapes, changing the entire factual landscape in very vivid and political terms of the Watergate scandal. And the tapes, of course, as I've mentioned, their existence was not the product of a system. There was no systematic requirement for the president to tape his conversations. And while previous presidents had taped them, previous presidents had controlled the use of their tapes, whereas Richard Nixon had not. Added to these imponderables, and unexpected elements was the fact that a confirmation struggle over Nixon's new attorney general, Elliot Richardson, led to the unprecedented appointment of the first special prosecutor to investigate a president. Again, not the product of any particular system. In the end, I would argue, Richard Nixon is the one who made his impeachment possible. Democratic leaders had opposed impeachment as a remedy until the Saturday Night Massacre. Tip O'Neill, Teddy Kennedy, while they were definitely no friends of Nixon and certainly wanted to undermine his, his authority and power, they were actually opposed to those members of their caucus, and there were a few, who were calling for impeachment in the summer of 1973. And of course, there were no Republicans calling for impeachment, despite the revelations from the Senate Watergate Committee. But after Nixon's firing of Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor, after the Nixon, Nixon, Al, you know, Al Haig is, is White House chief of staff, sent the FBI in to close down the offices of the Watergate special prosecution force. After it became clear that Nixon actually wanted to end an independent investigation of Watergate, it wasn't just Democrats who were calling for the impeachment, it was Republicans. Republicans and Democrats called for an investigation. 
That's not to say that the Republican leadership wanted Nixon out. They didn't at that point. But they actually believed that an impeachment inquiry was warranted. That was not likely to have happened had it not been for the Saturday Night Massacre. There's another accident of history. Nixon's reaction to the overwhelming pushback from the American people and Congress after he fired Cox was in a sense to undo what he was trying to do. So fearful of he, what was he of impeachment that he released the tapes that Cox had gone to the mat to get released. He released to the grand jury tapes. Now it turned out one had an 18 and a half minute gap, which of course wouldn't help him. And I believe he was responsible for it, not directly. Um, and also it, it turned out that a tape that, uh, that had been wanted, had been sought, didn't exist. But the fact is Nixon is the one who authorized the turning over of the cancer on the presidency conversation, the conversation I quoted from at the start of my talk today, he is the one who authorized it to go to the grand jury. It is often, often forgotten that not only did he hand over the cancer on the presidency conversation to the grand jury, um, he decided to allow for the naming of a new special prosecutor. So after going to the trouble of trying to end an independent investigation, he revived one. And then the White House was looking for a friendly, a, a friendly a prosecutor uh, who would somehow satisfy the public, so the optics had to be good, but who would not push as hard as Archibald Cox. And yet again, they failed. They chose a conservative Democrat named Leon Jaworski, thinking um, wrongly that Jaworski would turn the other cheek and not be as dogged and seeking more tapes. And that, as we know, turned out to be false. So a careful advocate for Nixon in reviewing this history would, would conclude that he ultimately made the wrong call. For the sake of, the, of our democracy and constitution, he made the right call. But is it predictable that presidents will actually do things that will incriminate them? I raise this point because of course, we know what would occur in the Trump administration. Um, had Nixon stonewalled completely, the grand jury would never have heard Dean's cancer on the presidency conversation with Nixon, which was very, very uh, influential in, in, con in convincing um, John Sirica and his chief law clerk that Nixon himself was guilty. They knew they'd been lying in the courtroom, but this convinced them that Nixon was the architect um, if not the architect was certainly witting of the conspiracy. This convinced the grand jury that Nixon was a co-conspirator. Um, and I think it's very important. Um, this would convince Leon Jaworski because Jaworski would be able to hear this and he would conclude that Nixon was guilty and had to leave office. So, um, Time and again, fortunately, Nixon made decisions that tightened the noose around the neck of his presidency. Now, why did he do that? Well, Nixon believed uh, or wanted actually to be viewed as a defender of American traditional institutions, even though he was more than prepared secretly to undermine institutions to advance his own political objectives, personal political objectives, he wanted the optics and the reputation of supporting American, the American constitution and constitutional institutions. So it was his desire not to fully assist his impeachers, but to look as if he was complying, that was so important to him. And in that era, his defenders in Congress wanted to be able to say to the American people that the president was complying. It gives you a sense of that political environment. In that era, a president saying, I don't believe in any presidential norms. I don't believe this is a witch hunt. He said it was a witch hunt. 
But he also recognized, and, and actually his administration did so in writing, that there was something unusual about the impeachment power that required presidential uh, cooperation. This is a standard that was set by George Washington um, in the 1790s. George Washington, there was material requested from George Washington. George Washington um, said, look, uh, the House can request this material. It was foreign policy material. The House could request this material, and I would have to comply if it had to do with an impeachment. But you don't have a real responsibility in foreign policy, and I don't have a constitutional responsibility to hand anything over. So it was the, it, but it was the Washington who set the standard that when the House demands something in an impeachment inquiry, the president can't say, can't deliver a, a blanket no. Now, the tapes complicated Nixon's game of selective compliance. In the spring of 1974, with the impeachment inquiry, um, uh, in full, in full, in full force, um, and the Jaworski team requesting more tapes. Nixon believed to keep to, to save his job, he had to show compliance with the subpoenas from the impeachment committee and Jaworski, and so he decided to provide transcripts. This would be a huge public relations fiasco. Now, one of the transcripts was the transcript of the cancer on the presidency speech which served to bolster arguments the dean had made about the president being involved in the, in the cover-up. It, it strengthened the argument the dean had been telling the truth, and it, it weakened Nixon's support among Republicans because Americans not only reacted to the fact that, that Nixon was clearly engaged in, in an aspect of the cover-up, but it was the, it was the the blatant cynicism of Nixon that came through these transcripts and the use of expletive deleted that undermined Nixon's credibility among some in the heartland. Nixon had decided, because Nixon edited these transcripts himself, uh, he didn't create them, but he edited them. Nixon decided to remove each time he said, God damn. Well, he said, God damn a lot. Not every, he didn't use the F-bomb all the time, but, but you didn't know what the slur was, what the slander was, what the, what the, what the uh, swear word was. So it looked like Nixon was swearing all the time. And actually, given the political climate of that time and the expectations of the presidency of 1974, that actually undermined his credibility. That was an unforced error. There was a debate in his White House over whether to do this. There were a number of people who said to Nixon, do not release these transcripts. Nixon felt he had to, to maintain his credibility. Um, the system worked in one sense, in that enough members of Congress were willing to act like jurors to give the outcome a strong flavor of bipartisanship. The impeachment system, if you look at the Constitution, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's designed in a very general way, but it implies that members of Congress should be acting to defend the Constitution. The Constitution, keep in mind, was written before there, there were national parties. And in fact, it was written by people who disliked national parties. So the impeachment process did not um, account for the possibility that the president would control a party that would control at least one House of Congress. Um, Nevertheless, despite the creation of the two-party system, there were members of Congress in 1974 who were willing to judge Nixon on constitutional terms and not on political terms. When the Supreme Court forced the handing over of even more tapes in July, the system worked again, but it didn't have to. Nixon wondered for a number of hours whether he should comply. And the Constitution is silent on what should happen when, the article, when, an, when an Article 3 and an Article 2 institution disagree on a matter of constitutional interpretation. Indeed, it was only John Marshall who, de de who decided that it was the Supreme Court that was the supreme arbiter of constitutional interpretation in Marbury versus Madison. Fortunately, despite Nixon's contempt for the law, he wished again to be viewed as respectful of institutions. 
So at the end of July 1974, he accepted the Supreme Court decision and handed over what would become the smoking gun conversation, the June 23rd, 1972 conversation, where he um, approved a plan to use the CIA to try to blunt the FBI's investigation of, of the money uh, linked to the burglars and linked to the committee to reelect the president. So in retrospect, did the system prove itself strong enough to contain a criminal president? I would argue barely and through luck, accident and the unintentional help of Richard Nixon. I would also argue there were so many gray areas in the system that a president who acted differently could have avoided the fate that befell Richard Nixon. I believe the Trump White House was determined not to make the same mistakes. I don't say Donald Trump was because I don't think Donald Trump knew the history of the, of the details of the Nixon uh, impeachment. I suspect and resignation or the, the impeachment investigation and, invest, and Nixon resignation. But I believe there were people around him who had studied this and in fact, who had even written about it. Um, 40 years later, Men who were young in the time of Watergate tested the hypothesis that Nixon could have survived 1973-74 politically had he stonewalled everything. Trump's people opted to test the norm that impeachments required some presidential cooperation. It was based on something Washington said. There was no law or constitutional requirement for it. It turned out that, they, that that risk worked out. Half of the American people, about half, and all of the president's party in Congress agreed that it was not an impeachable offense to stonewall an impeachment inquiry. Ms. Mitt, Senator Mitt Romney did care about the president's actions, but he actually voted no on the article about this unprecedented contempt of the impeachment process. Trump's Allies also, I believe, um, created a barrier to his firing Mueller. I believe that they recognized the role that the Saturday Night Massacre had played in changing the politics of the situation in 1973. And if they look carefully at the, at the record, they'd see that there was no serious effort to impeach Richard Nixon until he fired the one, the one independent investigation of his conduct which the public knew about. I think that this was behind the very strenuous effort to prevent Trump from doing what he wanted to do, which was to get rid of Mueller. Nixon's protectors tried to stop him from firing Cox. Both Alexander Haig, his chief of staff, and Elliot Richardson, his attorney general, tried to find a way around it. Nixon had wanted to fire Cox from the beginning of October 1973. It had nothing to do with the Yom Kippur War. That was just an excuse, a very useful excuse. No, from the beginning. And they stopped it the first time. But in the end, they couldn't stop him. And of course, Congress in our era failed. Congress did not have those, with one exception, um, uh, who were willing to take a constitutional role as a juror as opposed to a political role as a partisan. The GOP, with a few lone exceptions in Trump's first impeachment, made arguments about presidential powers that only Nixon's most fervent supporters in the House Impeachment Committee had made in 1974. But you know, in, in late July of 74, let me remind you, a solidly bipartisan majority had concluded that presidents could be impeached and convicted for a non-criminal abuse of power. They had considered the, the, the prospect of a, you know, of, of a narrow impeachment, that only crimes could force a president out. And they decided, a bipartisan majority decided, no, what the founders cared about were threats to our constitutional system. And sometimes those threats are not covered by our criminal law. They also rejected the idea that there had to be proof of the commission of a crime by the president. And they also accepted 
that presidents were responsible for the climate of criminality that they had created. The, the, every member of the, of the impeachment committee uh, in 1974 was a lawyer. And they all uh, assessed Nixon's, um, added his actions um, as in terms of, of what lawyers do. And they, for example, saw that, that Nixon's actions after Dean told him about the cover up were not consistent with something a lawyer would do to get at um, the source of criminality in their institution. But there was nothing in, con in the Constitution that assured that, con that the Congress that, that assessed a president would interpret the Constitution in this way, that members of Congress would do their duty the way that members of Congress did in 1974. As I said, the Constitution was written before the formation of national parties, and there were gray areas in its, in its um, uh, construction of the impeachment power um, that, that led to un, unforeseen challenges. So the January 6th experience and Watergate's are bookends. For all the contempt for public accountability, Nixon believed enough in institutions not to seek to destroy them. Donald Trump, on the other hand, didn't care. The Stop the Steal campaign was the antithesis of Nixon's handling of the decision in US v. Nixon. Nixon had lost and chose to respect the outcome, though he understood it probably, though he hoped it wouldn't, would probably meant the end of his presidency. He did some last minute things to try to stay in office. He shared transcripts of the smoking gun conversation with his closest allies, hoping they could help him find a way to survive. He tried to get the support of Southern Democrats. Nixon's, by the way, Nixon's um, uh, core uh, constituency was part of the Republican Party and conservative Democrats. That's how he planned to stay in office. That was the new Nixon majority. And when George Wallace told Nixon he wouldn't defend him any longer, George Wallace knew he had lost all Southern Democrats. So he probably knew it was the end of his presidency, but he wasn't sure. And of course, within a few days of uh, his accepting of the, of the Supreme Court decision and his handing over of the tapes, he would resign. Watergate, like January 6th, should be a reminder of the vulnerabilities of our institutions and the need for each and every generation to shore them up and of course, to teach our next generation to do better. Thank you for your attention today and have a great conference. Melissa and Shane, do you have any questions? Oh, uh, Melissa, I, I can't hear you. Melissa? Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for that, Tim. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, and I, I think the thing that is kind of echoing in my head is your line, Richard Nixon made his impeachment possible. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, when we're thinking about the constitution and we're thinking about Watergate and the presidency, is Watergate a story of the presidency or is it more a story of what the American public will allow the presidency to do? Um, how do you see that? Um, it's a great question. Uh, can I say it's, it's both? And can I add that it's also the story of Congress um, and of the media? Um, uh, I just, I wanted to underscore today the unintended, unexpected, unpredictable elements of the story, which is why it's so complex. Um, uh, if Agatha Christie had been writing it, uh, she would have had some, I love, Agatha, I love Agatha Christie, she would have had some red herrings, but there would have been a flow through line that'd be a lot clearer than the actual sort of um, TikTok of events in Watergate. So I, 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 I do believe that there is an element of what the American people will allow in this story. And, and that's why I mentioned political culture a few times. Um, there has been a change in what Americans are willing to uh, permit their presidents to do. Um, uh, President, um, Americans, for example, um, heard some rough language in the 2016 election and Republicans nominated Trump and the American people elected Trump. And in 1974, 
Nixon's expletive deleted undermine. And when I say undermine, we know this from public opinion polls. We can we can see what happened to his public opinion. Undermine his support among the American people. And he'd already lost support among Democrats. So we're talking about his support among Republicans. Um, so American political culture has changed. Um, there were diehard um, uh, Nixon fans to the end. And a number of the Republicans um, who voted to impeach Nixon uh, had a tough time um, back home. Um, actually, one would lose his job. Others, um, others um, would uh, would would have to go back and engage in conversations to try to explain why they turned against uh, their party's president. Um, but they took the decision anyway. We saw in 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 2019 and 2020 that, with the lone exception of Mitt Romney, um, Republicans were afraid to turn on their president, despite the evidence of the misuse of his power for political gain. So the, this is a story about what Americans expect and what happens in this country when Americans don't, don't hold their president up to the same constitutional standard as Americans did in 1974. Thank you. Um, I, I have one more question for you, and I, I think this kind of gets to what you were saying about, you know, the role of the citizenry to hold not just the president accountable, but also politicians accountable. It's interesting that over time, and you referenced this in your talk and your work at the Nixon Museum, that our memory of Watergate has shifted over time. Um, can you, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about how you've observed our memory of Watergate shifting in your experience in the roles that you've played? Well, I would just say that um, there were there were efforts to make uh, direct comparisons between the Trump period and, and Watergate. Um, uh, and, and a number of them just they didn't didn't fit uh, because of the difference in the political climate. Um, because of the existence of tapes uh, in the case of Richard Nixon, and, and because uh, I'm talking about the first impeachment. The second impeachment is a very different story. First of all, it, it happened in public. Uh, there was a bipartisan uh, majority. It wasn't a super majority, but there's a bipartisan majority that, that sought to remove him in the Senate. Um, so it's a different story. Um, and, and presidential compliance, A, wasn't as important because they, there wasn't much time for an investigation. And the, the, the information you needed was out there. We all saw it January 6th and in the days leading up to January 6th. But the first impeachment is different. And uh, the fact that there weren't tapes meant it, it was possible to make these arguments about you know what, what is the president responsible for? He should not be held responsible for what other people did um, that were made by Nixon's fervent defenders. And that meant that the, the factual environment was different. The fact that we weren't also working from one, one uh, basic set of facts. One of the things the impeachment inquiry did in 1973 and 74, mainly in 74, was they created one body of facts uh, that every member of the committee had to hear. And it was very boring. I mean, they actually had to listen to volumes being read to them in, in, cam, in camera, detail after detail. But the point was the committee staff, which by the way, was not divided into a majority staff and a minority staff, they had one staff. The staff wanted every member of the committee to be able to say they heard everything and not to say, well, the Democrats heard that, I didn't hear this. Well, of course, as we know, in 2019, 2020, um, there were you know various, pools of facts, um, and the president did not allow uh, members of his administration to testify. So you didn't, you didn't have the possibility of a Dean or Alexander Butterfield uh, of testimonies. Um, and so in a sense, the American people were not working from the same body of facts, which meant that there was no real opportunity to persuade people to change their mind about Trump. People change their minds about Nixon. Again, I'm not talking about Dem Democrats. Um, I, well, I'm talking about Southern Democrats, actually, in this instance. I'm talking about independents, and I'm talking about some Republicans. This didn't happen um, in the first impeachment. 
and it's and it's partly it's it's it, it's it's largely due, I think, to the climate we're in, and also to the fact that um, the the Democrats made a decision to rush the first impeachment and 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 not to try to push their subpoena power. That's worth a debate. Um, Trump probably would have survived anyway, but there were some very very harmful arguments that were made by his defenders, which really, um, which I hope were not accepted by the American people. The idea that uh, you have to commit a crime if you're a president to be removed. Um, that's, I mean, you don't want presidents to commit crimes, of course, but they can do much, they can do a lot of damage without committing a crime to our constitution. Um, and the fact that Congress didn't see, feel that it had an institutional article one responsibility to get documents, that despite the fact there was a president from their party, they still needed to support the history of constitutional congressional power, that was very dangerous for the system. Um, so um, uh, it was an, uh, the first impeachment very much weakened impeachment as a check on presidential authority. I've argued that the second impeachment restored some of that, but future Trumps, and perhaps even the man himself, um, saw that they could stonewall Congress, and that's very dangerous for the American people and the Constitution. It's great. I really enjoyed your, your presentation, um, Tim. We have, just have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one is about the, I guess, the the television landscape now, particularly Fox News. And, you know, if there had been something like that back in the Nixon era, what difference that might have made in terms of his reaction? And, you know, it's, it's it seems to me a question of personality as well. Nixon kind of craved the respect of the institutions and, and of the newspaper, of the newspaper press, as well as the broadcasters. Whereas, you know, bolstered by something like Fox News behind him, what difference might it might it have made to him as a as a character? Great question um, uh, from the audience. Um, well, Fox News made a huge difference. Um, and it made a difference, I would argue, not so much um, on on the public nationally, but it made it difficult for Republicans individually to go and do their constitutional duty because Fox News could focus on them um, and say, why is this, why is this particular member of the House or this particular member of the Senate doing that? And we're seeing it now with the January 6th committee. Um, and that and that was not the case um, in 1974. Now there, there were local newspapers that were doing it, conservative newspapers, absolutely. And there were town halls where individual citizens were asking, um, their particular member uh, of Congress, but there wasn't a concerted effort by a well-oiled media machine to go after them because they had doubts, because they had questions, because they wanted the president to turn over material. I think that has influenced individual members of Congress. This is just a hypothesis of mine, and also has made it easier to primary them because you have a national media outlet that people watch uh, that might help the primary effort to primary this person for not being committed enough to the president. Now, keep in mind that Trump um, did not have the full support of Fox News when he started his campaign. So Trump actually taught a lesson, a very bad one to Fox, about, uh, the, about this whole audience, a new audience. Uh, he added, I, was, I would think it arguable, he added to the, the Fox audience. Um, so, so part of this is Fox, but part of this is Trump. And, and to your point, Nixon was an introvert. Nixon, re, he receded into the White House during those months I was describing. When he was editing the transcripts, he did it in the residence. He spent hours doing that. He did not do what Trump did, which was to go to the American people and say, so which hunt, it's all wrong. And to, and to, and to, and to get his uh, followers excited. His followers saw him as a defensive man. Um, and this fed, I think, a, a sense of his guilt. And it also um, undermined the willingness of members of Congress to defend him. There's a, another very important part of the story, and I've, I've gone along, but I, I've given the, our nature of politics today. Richard Nixon didn't have coattails. In the 1972 election, he gets, he wins a huge landslide, but Congress is still in the hands of Democrats. Um, 
Republican, and I, I did a, a, a piece and I looked at, uh, this was after I left the Nixon library, but I looked at uh, 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 a, a congressional diary of a Republican um, and Republicans resented the fact that Nixon didn't fight hard enough for them. And this is very different from Trump. Trump actually had brought people into Congress, like Tommy, you know, uh, to run um, uh, the bunch of, 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 of members of Congress that were Trumpists. He had actually gone out and supported them. He had campaigned for them. They had won. Um, Nixon didn't, he had some loyalists in Congress, but nothing like Trump. So you had a, a Trumpist party in a way you did not have an Estonian Republican party. The Republican party was more complicated at the time. And a number of the people in the Republican party did not feel that they owed their power to, try, to Nixon in a way that was not true for Trump. So it's not just Fox, it's the loyalty to the political loyalty to Trump and the loyalty of the Trump people to Trump's chosen members of Congress. That was something quite different from the political landscape of 1974. Well, great, thank you. Um, just two other quick questions. I'll just ask a question. Well, we've got another one here actually. A question about a tape. On April 4th, um, Gordon Strong uh, wrote Haldeman that Liddy's intelligence plan had been approved with a $300,000 budget. This is a question from David Kaiser. And also that Mitchell was coming to the White House that day or the next to talk to Haldeman and Nixon. Has a tape of that meeting been released? Well, every, every every tape from that period has been reviewed and released. So I'm, I'm, I'm um, they, they, but the, uh, the the Nixon Library completed its complete review of the Nixon tapes in 2013. I I left in 2011, but I know the team, and they were working really hard. The abuse of power tapes, the one that uh, that Stanley uh, did such a great job of compiling those abuse of power segments uh, by congressional action had to come out first. And they came out um, at the end of the 1990s. Um, Stanley Cutler's abuse of power contains them. Uh, so any conversation regarding Watergate would have been reviewed for early release before the chronological release. And the chronological release was in 2013. I, I can't, my own mind can't think about what particular, I, I, it doesn't ring a bell that particular conversation, but they've all been reviewed and released. Um, and anything about Watergate by law had to be released, couldn't be withheld. Um, so I would just um, invite David and others uh, to contact the Nixon Library. In fact, uh, you know, ask for the, there's a tape finding aid, uh, which is really helpful and it's free and you can just ask for it and you can double check. By the way, I wanna underscore a very important document um, there is the, uh, the document that David just referenced, but there's another document um, that I think is highly interesting. It's from um, the same day, but it's the notes that Strawn took for himself. Strawn had an interesting uh, note-taking system. Um, he it was an action item, system, and and what he would do is he would he would uh, record what had been told to him. And then um, he would then note that he had shared it. Um, um, and he noted after the conversation with Magruder um, that Magruder told him that two operations had been improve, approved, um, not four. Now, the fact that Magruder was that granular and saying operations means that Strawn understood that that Mitchell had a menu of options and had chosen two. Now, if you know that there are two operations, you probably know what they are. And if Strawn knew what they were, then Haldeman knew what they were because Strawn is just, he, 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 is, he is an intermediary for Haldeman. So what were those two operations? What did Haldeman know in April? And we also know from a strong note, and these are all available and they're online. We know from, I guess it's April 14th. I apologize, I think it's the 14th. This is when um, we know that uh, on from a note that Haldeman tells Strawn to call Magruder to say, switch the Liddy's capacity from Muskie 
to McGovern. Well, okay, Haldeman knows that there's a capacity. Haldeman probably knows that there are two operations that have been approved. Haldeman knows there's the amount of money that's been approved. So Haldeman must have known what this entailed. I'm just saying, I, I'm, I'm using a lot of must-haves because I'm speculating, but if you, we all, those of us who are on this uh, uh, Zoom now have studied the presidency of Nixon, and we know that it was tightly controlled by Haldeman. And it was tightly controlled by Haldeman because Nixon wanted it to be tightly controlled. And the general strategic approach was set by Nixon in conversations with Haldeman, even if Nixon didn't get involved in the tactical decisions. So I, I would just like to highlight th those two particular documents, in addition to the one that David mentioned. Great, uh, yeah, because David's actually presenting tomorrow very much with that thesis that Haldeman knew a lot more than he's thought to have. Um, just a couple of more questions, one from Jefferson Morley, uh, which ties in with what we were talking about yesterday, Tim, about the second Martinez uh, CD, DVD. And uh, so Jeff's actual question is, um, what do you recall about the conversation and what was so sensitive about it? I mean, you may be not at liberty to discuss it if it's still classified, but uh, but there, there's a related question about national security reviews and anything that's been uh, redacted or, or bleeped out before. Um, do, do things open up with the second review in your experience or is it kind of lost to history, those those national security uh, details? So two, two, two questions merged there. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'm I'm really surprised that that second um, that that second uh, disc isn't available. It's been 11 years uh, since I was at the National Archives. It's been, I think, 13, 14 years since I did that interview. I have no idea why, but I can tell you, uh, Jefferson, that um, given the President's Recordings and Materials Preservation Act of of 1974, um, I uh, had the right to make sure that anything regarding Watergate was was accessible. In um, so, uh, I believe that um, there are. I don't remember if they're from the second disc, uh, but there uh, there are some uh, excerpts from from uh, the. Martinez conversation that are in the Watergate, there's a, a Watergate information um, portal in the, in the exhibit. And I, I would recommend that you, that you contact my former colleagues at the Nixon Library. And first of all, find out if somebody has done a mandatory review for that second uh, disc and ask them if there are um, Martinez um, segments regarding Watergate that um, that are that are accessible that are not in the first um, that are not in the first disc. Um, I I got out as much as I could before I left uh, the office, uh, and I hope that with a mandatory review uh, that all of that uh, interview would come out. Um, and I left confident that not that that uh, what was necessary i left confident that that no that there were no that, that the, there was no there's no part of the story significant part of the story that this abuse of power story that was missing but i really preferred for the entire um desk to be released so the entire interview to be released so i i'm very hopeful um i'm not hope i'm not involved in the process but i i just hope that you will just ask and, ha and have it reviewed. And I'm hopeful that if it's reviewed, it's gonna be released. I'm, I'm disappointed to see a number of those interviews are still being processed. I, I don't understand, but I also am not gonna be critical because I know how understaffed the National Archives is. And I know that the presidential library system, if some of you have seen a recent article that I wrote, the presidential library system, unfortunately is under a lot of pressure um, from, um, uh, from the top at NARA and, and needs more resources, needs more support, which I hope it will get. Yeah, great. And I mean, the, the final part of that question, I guess, was from Benjamin, Benjamin Hampton. If, if a tape has been through National Security Review and uh, parts have been uh, edited out, 
Um, in your experience, does that loosen up over time? Do more of these redactions or bleeped out material become available or? Sure. In fact, in, after 1970, after 2013, the uh, Nixon Library started a re-review, well, a, a re-review of the earlier tapes. Um, and uh, you will note uh, if you go and look at the new versions um, that a lot of the national security material has now been restored to the tape. So, but I, I, you know, I haven't listened to all of the new ones. I, I did write a piece, some of you may have seen about some comments that Ronald Reagan made. Um, uh, the, that was a privacy review. That was a, that was not, had not been re, uh, redacted for national security reasons, but those tapes do include more national security material. So don't worry about things being lost to history. Um, first of all, the, the tapes, with the exception of 18 and a half minutes um, are intact. I mean, the, the sound is intact and uh, the US government will have it forever. And my hope is that we'll see over time that the percentage of, of closed material will disappear too. And, and I, I would have you say, take a look at what percentage it hasn't been released. I want as much as, I mean, I did then and I still do as a scholar now, want as much open as possible, but we're fortunately not talking about a, a huge percentage. It's, I, I can't remember what it is. It's, 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 anyway, it's not, it's not a huge percentage. It's, it's still too much, but we're moving, they're moving in the right direction. And I am quite hopeful that it will continue to move in the right direction, but keep pressing on the archives. I mean, the point is you have a right um, to ask and to fill out a formal request and they have an obligation to respond. So please do. And, and if you, you know, if there are tapes that you would like to see re-reviewed, um, you know, David, if you find from April of 1972 that there is a gap, not a gap in the debt, but that there's something that should have been released, you think, or you're concerned about something, ask for that tape to be reviewed because the, um, the National Archives is doing that right now. Um, okay, well, thanks very much. I mean, I think we've gone 10 minutes over. The showing shows the engagement with your, your talk. So thanks, I really, really enjoyed it. Melissa, do you have um, just, just to- Absolutely. Uh, Tim, thank you for being here. Um, I think, you know, it's so salient to have you speaking today of all days um, and to just share your expertise and, and your knowledge about the presidency and, and helping us to put all of this into perspective. So thank you. Uh, Melissa and Shane and all of you out there, uh, thank you for taking the time to listen and uh, good luck with the conference. I'm sure you'll be adding to the public record and, um, you know, the mysteries continue and the work continue. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so thanks, Tim, and thanks to our audience. We're back at two o'clock Eastern with our next panel um, investigating the Watergate break-in. So I hope you'll rejoin us then. And thanks again to Tim and Melissa. Cheers. Bye.